Catoctin Creek is a proud supporter of Bourbon Pursuit. At Catoctin Creek, they pride themselves on making traditional rye whiskey as it would have been made in the 1800s. Virginia grain, Virginia water, Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is Sweet Mash Kentucky Straight Bourbon and Rye Whiskey, made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged, and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. Here's a case of whiskey, d- different types, different ages, different things. And I just took that case of whiskey, went to Dr. Vela of NC State and said, I'm here. Welcome. Here's a case of whiskey. Let's have some fun. Let's, let's study this. Hey everyone, it's episode 317 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, talking about the science of whiskey webs, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Last week, we selected a 1792 foolproof at Barton. It was a hot July day, but as soon as we made it into the warehouse, that first floor kept us all nice and cool. We were joined by Danny Kahn, the master distiller at Barton 1792, who you heard back on episode 284. After a few rounds of back and forth and blind sampling, I felt like we chose the best 1792 foolproof that we have ever done. It's sweet oak and had delicious fruit flavors. Remember, you can join our private barrel program by going to bourbonpursuit.com. Just in time to round out National Grilling Month, Knob Creek and The Boardsmith are launching Knob Creek Bourbon Barrel Grilling Planks. Crafted from American White Oak Bourbon Barrels, the premium grilling planks bring the bold signature flavors of Knob Creek to your backyard culinary experience and creates the perfect pairing to a glass of Knob Creek Bourbon. These are available now on TheBoardsmith.com for $25 for a set of two. That includes free shipping in the U.S. Maker's Mark has a new attraction for folks that are visiting the Bourbon Trail, and it's a new Airbnb. Well, new is probably not the right word to use. In fact, it's a home that has belonged in the Samuels family since the 1800s, and it's a Civil War site where the James Gang was arrested. In the home are artifacts of the Maker's history, like the legendary deep fryer where Margie Samuels dipped the first bottle with red wax. I got a chance to tour the house, and it's an insane timeline of Maker's Mark history. You can read more about it and book your stay at thesamuelshouse.com and it starts at $1,250 per night. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Well, it's finally here. We've talked about it for a few weeks now and Pursuit United is available on sealbox.com. In just the span of 96 hours, almost 500 bottles have been sold. I promise you, do not miss out on this one. It will be also hitting retail shelves very soon in Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas. So ask your stores and local area to make sure they pick it up and distributor information can be found on our website at PursuitSpirits.com. Garrison Brothers Distillery has released a new port cask finished bourbon named Guadalupe and it's to pay homage to one of the state's most beautiful rivers. It's bottled at 107 proof and will be available year round. About twice a year, we have a guest on the show that just amazes us with the science behind bourbon. And in this episode, we learn how bourbon has almost a DNA-like composition. Stuart Williams is a professor and directs the Microfluidic Systems Laboratory at the University of Louisville. He stumbled on a fascinating find that shows when bourbon begins evaporating, it creates this web that resembles constellations in the dark sky. Stuart was able to document his findings, and it shows how bourbons that come from the same distillery create a common web. We're going to learn more about this, but really, the pictures speak louder than words. 
So make sure you check out his website at whiskeywebs.org and you can see the stunning representations. And Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to get their unique cash strength whiskeys from around the world. Just visit barrelbourbon.com today and click the buy now button. Bourbon to your door. It's as easy as that. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Jay and Linden. What up, Jay and Linden? I'm hoping that's his real name and he doesn't have like a middle name or he lives in Linden and his name is Jay. I really super hope that his middle name is in, like I N. That would be so cool. Jay writes me, uh, how does the average bourbon drinker identify source bourbon? Now, I'm, when we say average bourbon drinker, I'm assuming that this person is just walking into the store, picking up a bottle, and making a purchasing decision right then and there. That's how I'm going to basically define an average bourbon drinker. They're not getting on podcasts. They're not listening to reviews. These are people who uh, are invested in bourbon but they don't want to necessarily go above and beyond to learn about it. Because if you want to go above and beyond to learn about it, you got to buy a book, you got you to gotta learn. And honestly, if you want to learn about Source Bourbon, where everything comes from, my book, Bourbon Curious, uh, tells you where everybody gets their whiskey. But other than that, there are two ways that you can tell if something is sourced. Uh, one is the state of distillation. Now, the majority of the source bourbon that is out there is coming from Indiana, which is the MGP Ingredients Distillery, or from Tennessee, which is the George Dickel Distillery. Now, they make everybody sign an NDA, but it's just common knowledge that George Dickel is, has their stuff up on uh, wholesale. And so if you see the state of distillation is different than where it is bottled, That is often a telltale sign that it is indeed a source product. However, there are types of source products that are contract distilled, such as the case with our good friends here, Kenny and Ryan with Pursuit Spirits, where they contract distill with Bardstown Bourbon Company. Now, sometimes they blend those things in. uh, Sometimes they age them and uh, bottle them straight. But that's harder to tell. But usually those brands that do that are very proud of it, and they disclose it somewhere on their website or on their bottle. Now, that being said, that it should be looked at very differently. As uh, Michter's Joe Malioko once said, you know, when you contract a steel, you basically are still the chef. You're just borrowing someone else's kitchen. So that is one way, is basically source of distillation and just looking on the bottle to see if they disclose where they distilled it. Also, the state of distillation. Very, very important. So the next thing is price. Now, the economics of source bourbon is basically that these are companies that are buying barrels at a premium, and they usually have to pay people along the way. So they're having to pay extra costs like labor for bottling or storage uh, at, uh, at warehouses. So they have all of these costs that are built into what you are buying. So a product that would be, say, $30 for Heaven Hill or $40 for Four Roses, in order for them, for the source product to get any kind of profit whatsoever, they must mark it up to what feels like double the price. But really, they're just just getting the same margins that Four Roses would have gotten or Maker's Mark would have gotten. But they have to jack that price up to get any kind of profit whatsoever. And in fact, you would be shocked to know that often these products that are like $80, $90, $150, their cost into that bottle, uh, you know, soup to nuts, is usually between $50 and $80. So they have a lot of cost that goes into each one of those bottles, and so they have to jack up that price. So the other method that I say is very effective for finding source whiskey is, is it a ridiculous price for something that would be... 30 to 40 bucks if it was by Jim Beam, Heaven Hill, or Four Roses. Now, that's a different lens to put on. That's a different way to think about it, but that's one other way to do it. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Chart. Very good question from Jay and Linden, who wrote me on fredminnick.com. If you want to be like Jay and Linden and have a cool name, and maybe you can be like uh, uh, Luke of London. Oh my gosh, that would be a way cool name, Luke of London. If anyone's listening to this and you're from London and your name is Luke, 
if you don't write me on fredminnick.com, I'm going to be very disappointed in you. Very, very disappointed in you. But that's going to do it for this week, folks. Be safe out there. Cheers. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Just kidding here today, but I'm talking about something that is always one of our the biggest hits of episodes that we always have, and that is diving into the science of bourbon. We've had researchers and scientists and doctors on before, you know, of Tom Collins and Pat Heist, and we go deep into terroir and to uh, yeast and all these different things that actually make up compounds of what we are drinking. Because don't be wrong, we we love drinking whiskey and we love having an opportunity to sit down and talk about uh, you know, family memories and kind of bonds that exist, but there's other bonds that exist. There's actual chemical bonds that happen with inside of whiskey. And today we're going to learn about actually about how some of those bonds exist in the form of evaporation and how they are making almost pieces of art at the end of the day. So it's going to be a really cool way to kind of show exactly how this the advancement of just whiskey and how it's making its way into the world of science and not just like at home science. I'm talking like at the university level of science here. So it's really cool to see this really starting to grow. And I'm very excited to be able to bring on our next guest of today, who's probably going to be a way, a way smarter than me, but he's going to be able to drop a lot of knowledge bombs on you all about really what some of the, the science that's going on inside of bourbon. And I think it's going to be really cool when we get into it about it. It's actually only a bourbon. It's not even in other types of whiskey, which is check one for the home team here. So let's go ahead and we'll get into it. So today on the show, we have Dr. Stuart Williams. He's an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Louisville. So Stuart, welcome to the show. Kenny, thank you for having me. And that's a wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, I've I've done it a few times, so we're, we're getting better at it every <laughs> single time. But before we get into, you know, more about your science and, and the research that you've been doing, I kind of want to let people know a little bit about you. Um, kind of know, you know, you are here in Louisville, but kind of get people to an idea of, you know, your background, your history, and, you know, have you had a passion in bourbon or any kind of uh, want or need to want to get into it before this actually came about as well? Sure. Now, I was born and raised in Louisville, and I'm glad to be employed in my hometown and actually bringing research uh, to the forefront our, and uh, the, the experiences and the accomplishments that we have at the university level and actually linking it to whiskey. So this um, how we got linked into whiskey was all, we'll say, circumstance. And I'll get into that later. But to give you my background and my experiences prior to this, is that my background is in microfluidics. In other words, how does fluid behave at the micro scale? So droplets, thin films, how things evaporate, and also micro devices. So if we're going to create devices typically used in healthcare settings, how can we use that technology and apply it to this realm? Okay. So you got to give me a little bit more about like fluid dynamics and like what was this part of the science that like drew you in because when you're in, when you're going through school you, there's there's a whole world of things that you can go into and you looked at evaporation and said you know what there's something about here that i really love no absolutely so to give you um a scale of sort of where microfluidics is so a lot of us are familiar with say a meter a meter is we'll say a little less than than three feet and if you divide that meter into a thousand equal parts you get your millimeter so those are things that we've likely dealt with and are familiar with but now let's divide that millimeter into a thousand more parts and now we're at micrometers and micrometers is very important at least at the scale that we're looking at because that's where particles so we'll say uh, cells a red blood cell for example is about eight micrometers or yeast you brought up earlier. That's about three to four micrometers. Now, I know there's varieties beyond that. I'm simplifying that. But so we look at how these particles behave with the fluid and their surrounding fluid. So drag will influence where particles go. When particles interact with each other, do they agglomerate or do they disperse? And that's an important topic in whiskey and also in other industries as well. And then we'll also take it a step further. Let's take that micrometer now and divide that by a thousand steps. And now you're into a nanometer regime. 
So to put that into perspective, molecules are on the order of one to two nanometers, give or take. And even the turn of a DNA helix is on the order of two or, th two or three or four nanometers. So I am trying to bridge the scale. So you're handling fluid, say a syringe of fluid in your hand, but yet we really care about how the particles interact with each other and even how chemicals react with each other. And then what's the bigger picture when you bring all of that together? So my research focuses on those interactions between all of those entities to get a successful device. So if I had to guess what like your favorite like DC or Marvel comic would be, would it be like Ant-Man where he had to go and he just got smaller and smaller and smaller into like this abyss of just like particles? No, absolutely. Yes. Because, because it's really fascinating to just think about how, like, because I'm a tinker, like I, I like to build things, like do some woodworking on the side, things like that, but you can't just go in and grab a cell, right? You have to do some interesting physics. So I have colleagues who try to say, separate live cells from dead cells or cells that produce a favorable property versus others that don't. And you can't just go in and just grab them off the shelf, right? They're so tiny. We have to think of creative ways to monitor them, to separate them, and to overall uh, get a product that'll be useful at the end of the day. Okay. Maybe it's making sense. I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> so kind of talk about how how did whiskey start playing a role into to fluid dynamics here? And, and I, I don't know if I, if I caught it earlier, but like, you know, if you had, you know, any ties to the bourbon industry or just mm -hmm. ever felt like involved with it in any way up until this point? Yes. So my, um, one of the research areas that I am interested in within the microfluidic field is an area called colloid science. And a colloid is a fancy term for a particle that is in a suspension. So for example, fog is a colloidal suspension in that you have small liquid mist droplets suspended in air. Or you have, um, say, stained glass. Stained glass has tiny nanoparticles embedded in a solid glass. So these are all suspensions. I am trying to figure out, or at least that's an interest of mine, trying to figure out more about the fundamental science regarding colloids. So a few years ago, back in 2017, I had, I had an opportunity to do research during my sabbatical with a world leader at NC State. His name is Orlin Velev. So before I went out there, I tried to find out, okay, is there a local industry? Is there some research problems? In other words, can I just grab a problem with me? And then when I go on my sabbatical, can I study that problem along with studying other things? So I reached out. I had a family history with Brown Foreman. My great uncle, uh, Dr. James Spanier, uh, was a chemist at Brown Foreman and worked his way up to VP. And there is, um, he was there, I think, starting the mid 30s and then retired in, we'll say, the early 70s, I believe. And unfortunately, I didn't get to know him too well because I was, he passed away when I was in grade school. But still, that family history and that lineage was there, and he had a good impression there. So there is, I highly recommend, there's an oral history. Um, I believe the series is called The Distiller, Distillery, yeah, there it is, The Distillery Industry of Kentucky. It was interviews done in the mid 80s, about 84 to 86. And he was one of the interviewees, but there's others if within, it gives you a great picture of what went on in the distilling industry around that time. And he was talking about different stories about how he was a part of a program that would help look at, say, the temperature maturation and different temperature controls like warehouse control. For example, um, my uncle was telling me a story how he helped facilitate, say, warming of a warehouse during winter, and then at a certain time, opening the doors to let the cold air in. And then just going through these different processes and, and experimenting with that. And he said in the interview, or my, um, Dr. Spanier said in the interview, that he could make a whiskey in four years that would taste like six years be doing this temperature modulation. So he was a pure scientist at heart and trying to apply these applications to Brown Foreman. So I reached out to Brown Foreman, getting back to the colloid science, I reached out to Brown Foreman saying, okay, can you tell me more about any problems that you have? What is, is there any colloids in the whiskey industry? And lo and behold, there is. It's a significant problem. And it yields, or it's related, I should say, to filtration. So if you take your whiskey right out of the barrel, they do say a strainer, so they get some of the- um, The big chunks, if you the will. The big yeah. chunks, absolutely. They get that out, but then they dilute it down so they can sell more product. And at about, 
give or take, depending on the product and the maturation, but at about 86 proof, if you dilute below that, it gets really cloudy. And I've made a lot of, uh, I've got a little, inter- a lot of interesting looks when I go through a, a liquor store and I hold the bottle up to light or even better yet, I bring in my laser pointer and I shine it through, <laughs> I shine it through the, the bottle because the, it was, these particles, they scatter light. They look foggy, just like how milk looks foggy or looks white because light interacts with the particles and reflects that light back. So as you dilute the product, if you're going into a liquor store, it's pure aesthetics. If you have two bottles and one is foggy and one is not, you're just going to intuitively go towards the one that has the nice, rich, amber, clear color. So I talked with Brown Foreman and they wanted to know, hey, we want to know more about colloid science. We have a good idea about it, but there's always more that can be learned. Let's, here's, here's a case of whiskey. D- different types, different ages, different things. And I just took that case of whiskey, went to Dr. Vela in NC State and said, I'm here. Welcome. Here's a case of whiskey. Let's have some fun. Let's let's study this. So so that's where- Talk about, I, there, that's a way to introduce <laughs> yourself, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, so I was there trying to learn more about colloid science and just having this problem that is of interest in the whiskey industry. And, and but prior to that point, I didn't like dive into, say, the science of whiskey or anything like that. But of course, I dived in head first, had some time during my sabbatical to look into that and other problems. And there I was in a, uh, in a laboratory with some whiskey bottles in the laboratory, getting some interesting looks from students and just and had an interesting smell as well. People love the smell of the laboratory, um, but it, w- it was a good time. I appreciate the time there. It's one of the few times that you can sit there and drink and do this. You'd be like, no, literally, like, this is for science. Like, it's okay. Just trust me on this one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's great. And one of the, when I was there, um, and we were looking into this co- colloid issue and how colloids form. And one thing that we were interested in is at the time, there was a study released in 2016 by Howard Stone's group. Howard Stone's group is, is someone who studies colloid science and thin films and such and evaporation at Princeton. And they were inspired by, um, there's an artist named Ernie Button, and he has a gallery named Vanishing Spirits. So if you Google that and look up those images, it's an artistic gallery of what the residues that whiskey leaves behind. And from that, he illuminated it with different schemes and it was very vibrant, very colorful. But what he was interested in is why? Why does it form a film? Why does it form these interesting little patterns? What, what is it about whiskey that does this? Because with respect to Howard Stone and his interest in this is he typically studies coffee rings. Now what coffee rings are, and you can do the same with tea. So anyone who's spilt coffee on a tabletop or a coaster or whatnot, if you actually study the coffee ring itself and the pattern, let's say you have a drop and it evaporates, it's darker around the perimeter instead of the middle. And why that is, is that you can imagine that the coffee is a, looks, of course, brown, but those brown color comes from small granules of coffee that made it through the filter, but they're tiny enough to where they're suspended. But then as the droplet evaporates, those granules get, or those small particles, those colloids get caught at the perimeter and they don't circulate around anymore. They get trapped right there. And that's why the perimeter is darker in color than the rest of that droplet when it's evaporated. And that problem is interesting, especially for anybody, we'll say paint, or anybody else who wants to uniformly coat a surface evenly, they want their product evenly dispersed. So they want to be able to apply it uniformly, we'll say in the painting application. So if you can create a liquid, and this is why Howard Stone looked at whiskey and said, hey, if we evaporate whiskey, it's a uniform film. So when I showed up at NC State and with Dr. Velov, we had a conversation and said, hey, we have a case of whiskey. We have a case of whiskey of all these different types, right? The, the, the brown form provided for us. And they, with respect to Howard Stone's study, they only looked at scotch. They didn't look at anything else. And we know that bourbon is much different <laughs> than scotch. So we decided, well, let's evaporate some droplets. And we're not evaporating a lot. To, to put the evaporation, we'll say the droplet size into perspective, we say a shot is 
I'll go on the small order of things. So, so a small ounce, maybe three quarters of an ounce is about 20 milliliters. So if you take a single milliliter and divide that by a thousand, you will get a micro liter and a micro liter is about a cubic millimeter. So a, a healthy sized raindrop, if you want to think of it that way. And that's what we're evaporating. So from a single shot, you could evaporate 20,000 with some dilution, 50,000 droplets. So we're not being wasteful for those who are thinking, oh man, you're, you're evaporating all this whiskey. What are you doing? No, it, we're, we're taking tiny, tiny drops. It's, we, we barely scratch the surface in terms of the volume of bourbon that we have. So that's what we were wanting to do. We were actually wanting to evaporate bourbon and seeing if there's a difference in terms of the evaporation between this and the previous study done by Howard Stone's group. Well, cool. Okay, so we kind of get a little bit of the purpose here, but I guess in a in a nutshell, also let's let's make sure we explain to people like what is what is the overall you know focus of this like as in like what is a whiskey web like what is it that you're trying to get at? Mm -hmm. So the whiskey, with respect to the whiskey web part, when we evaporated bourbon, and we'll say it's at full proof, we'll say ninety proof to a hundred proof, which is about forty or fifty percent alcohol by volume. When we evaporated those, they did create a film and it like it, it almost was like a white dot when you shine light on it, just like a white dot. There's no pattern to it. It's plain, it's uniform. And if you want to look for a, a way to do a uniform layer, that's fantastic. Great. We're done. However, we noticed that if we diluted it and then evaporated it, then we got some interesting patterns and that made us think, okay, what is in bourbon whiskey that is making these patterns that they're, they're not uniform anymore. They create these wrinkles and, and I'll get into how those are actually formed, but we actually have to look at the composition of whiskey itself. And there are, as you mentioned earlier, there, there are thousands of chemicals. It's a very complex process. And I myself am unfamiliar with all the chemicals that are in there, but if I had to divide it into two general categories, so after the water and the ethanol part, so, so we'll take that aside, and those are two important players in this, you have your surfactants and you have your polymers. Now, let me get into what a surfactant is. So okay, I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess because yeah. I think I did some, I did some. Uh, I don't want to say homework, but I was doing some uh, some research trying to like take care of my lawn. Is a surfactant something that helps it like stick to a surface? Yes, you, you're, oh. you're, you're, right, you're, right, you're right on target. So I nailed it. All there right. you go. Sur surfactant is actually short for a phrase, a surface active agent. So th that phrase there, an active agent, that means it's, it's doing something. Now, it typically looks for an interface. What I mean by that is if you have a water-air interface, that's an interface. You have two different types of materials that don't readily um, are, are soluble with each other. There's a, there's a line. There's a line in the sand. It says, hey, here's an interface. Air and water can't really interact with each other. You can say the same thing about oil. So for example, you have oil drops on a dirty pan that you're trying to scrub. It's much easier. If you scrub it with water, you only do a so-so job. But once you throw that soap in there, once you throw that detergent in there, once you throw that surfactant in there, now it does a much better job. So envision a surfactant as a tiny molecular ball head and that head loves water. It's hydrophilic, meaning it loves water. It's happy in water. It wants to be in water. And then there's a carbon chain behind it. That carbon chain, think of it like a tail. Um, and depending on the um, surfactant, those tail tails can be longer or shorter or have different energies associated with them. But that tail hates water. It's hydrophobic. And what it does, for the case of the dirty dish, the tail will just stick itself in the oil and it's happy in the oil, but then the head that loves water is just outside the oil. So in other words, it acts to lift up the oil off the surface because the tail is just going to keep on getting inside that oil droplet. And then from that, it'll help whisk away the oil from your dirty dishes. So for the case of whiskey, there are surfactants that are there that are typically, most surfactants are derived for, from organic materials. And of course, whiskey is loaded with them from the distillation, from the aging, everywhere in between. So there's a lot of organic compounds that are within your whiskey. And then from that, you have your surfactants and then you have your polymers. The, the most um, prevalent polymer, or at least one that's I'll say most familiar polymer in terms of whiskey is lignin. So your ethanol is in that during the aging process, 
the ethanol helps disperse and extract and develop those surfactants and polymers within the barrel. So now your whiskey, and again, it's it, taking the chemistry, the rather complex chemistry and simplifying it. Now you have a mixture of water, ethanol, surfactants, and polymers all ready to go. And we were looking at how they evaporated within these droplets to get to that whiskey web. Okay. All right. So we now we're, we're starting to li- get in the process here. And I think this is probably where we can get really nerdy here. And I think that you did, you did, a, you did a very good job of helping me like explain it like I'm five. So now I know that when I'm doing the dishes that there's a, there's a whole lot more than just soap and elbow grease that's going into this. So kind of talk a, a little bit more about, uh, you know, colloids and filtration, flocking, and kind of like how all those kind of play a piece of it. Because we, we mentioned at the very beginning how colloids, like mm-hmm. there's there's definitely a part of this. Um, and filtration plays a big role when you are going to do whiskey. I mean, we've talked all the time about being non-chill filtered or just filtering out like the big chunks. Like, And is there a point where you can actually filter too much? You There is an absolute point where you can filter too much. And even uh, going back to the uh, Dr. Spanier sort of radio interview, when I looked at it, they said that there were times where if you go through a filtration process, now taking that back, you can filter via chill filtration. Another way is having like a a charcoal filtration, like similar to maybe what some people have in their, say, Brita filters or their refrigerators, whatnot. Those are charcoal filters. So you can put whiskey in in a charcoal bath and The uh, Dr. Spanier was saying, yeah, there's where you can excessively do it to where it comes out clear and all the flavors, or at least all the good flavors is effectively gone. So it is definitely a balancing act in terms of how you filter out these particulates and the, what makes it easy to filter or at least easier to filter is that these particles, these agglomerates, they actually increase in size when you chill it. And that's why you chill it. These surfactants that we just talked about, the if you chill it and or when you add water, those tails hate their environment. They hate, it's more water in here, I don't like it, or it's colder in here, I don't like it. And what those tails will do is start to interact with each other and then form a ball and form a colloid and an agglomerate. And then as you chill it, it gets larger and larger. And then during the filtration process, that's where you can capture at least the um, the unwanted particles that you want. Now, I consider it, I know it's, it's a topic of debate of chill filtered, non-chill filtered, straight from the barrel, all the above. I generally like to look at it as a part of the recipe. Because, I mean, if you think about Tennessee whiskey is sort of in that realm, is that they had that uh, charred maple uh, filtration process. It is part of their recipe, parts of giving it its its flavor. So, yes, filtration is very important. There's different ways of doing it, and you can very easily overdo it. But like we said, those surfactants is effectively what you're filtering out. And then as you chill it and or add more water, they get larger, and then that makes them makes at least the fil- filtering part a little bit easier when they're larger and easier to grasp. That is the best explanation I've ever heard of non-chill filtering in my life, <laughs> it, by far. Like it was, it, you probably, I could have asked somebody at a distillery and they could have, have explained it any better than that. That was, that's fantastic. So I guess another question is, so if colloids are a byproduct of the filtering and, and the chill filtering process, is there just something to say that like, and you said it's all based on recipe. I mean, is there something to say that it's good to have more colloids versus less colloids. Like, is that a thing or no? That's a good question because we we have noticed that. Well, okay, I'll take it one a different way. If you want it dispersed and clear, and you don't want any say cloudiness at all, then and that's where some micro distillers do, as you're aware of, well, well aware of, is that they bottle it typically at higher proof. And if you, so the ethanol, what it does is it helps solubilize and disperse and make all the surfactants that otherwise want to get together. It's sort of the the ethanol compounds get within those carbon chains and say, no, 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 you're happy. You're fine. Don't, don't don't agglomerate. There's not too much water here. You're okay. And then they just sort of stay dispersed. So if you don't want it to be cloudy, then you want to remove those colloids that would otherwise be cloudy. So you dilute it with water, you make more product that way, you make more slightly diluted product that way, but then you filter out the cloudiness 
or some some people say you filter out some bitterness. And again, that gets back to the flavor and the recipe and that stance. But that's where it, if you want to keep all those complex flavors, typically it's more complex when you don't filter out those colloids. Okay. It's starting to make sense then. So let's let's get a little nerdy into this as well, because you sent me some some documentation over at this and I started, I basically took notes. I looked at it and I was like, guys, I have no idea what's going on here, but hopefully you can help explain it to everybody like I'm five. So talk a little bit about like the colloid openings and like the physics of droplet evaporation and how this played into your research as well. Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. Total Wine & More is ready for summer. They've got all your pours for the great outdoors, like their top 12 wines under $15. And raise a glass to America with a star-spangled selections of sips made in the USA and beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. Why not mix it up and serve a brown derby or a peachy keen at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorant, like ready-to-freeze cocktail pops and fun, fizzy, hard seltzers. Lime, pineapple, and peach, anyone? So no matter if you're grilling, chilling, or both, you're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers. In-store or TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery just launched a 3D behind-the-scenes tour of their Bernheim Distillery, the largest independent family-owned bourbon distillery in the world. See for yourself how they produce 1,553-gallon barrels of new-make whiskey per day before it makes its way to the barrel for aging. From grain trucks to copper stills, drop into this 3D experience at heavenhilldistillery.com and navigate your way around the distillery for a step-by-step look at how they craft their award-winning lineup of American whiskeys. Heaven Hill reminds you, think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. So talk a little bit about like the colloid openings and like the physics of droplet evaporation and how this played into your research as well. Perfect. So envision a drop. I'll say, so a small droplet, let's say it's water right now. We'll, we'll add more, we'll, we'll mix more into it later. But if it's just water on a surface, imagine, so it's almost like a hemisphere, right? So, so you have a, a thick middle and it tapers out towards the edge. And depending on your surface that it's on, we'll say it's glass. On the, it, Typically water and glass is it's slightly hydrophilic, like it wants to wet it, but it balls up just a little bit. And there's and there's special surfaces out there, like say a lotus leaf or a lot of plant life leaves where the, the leaves want to beat up. And that's just the, the specialized surface that it's on. So there's different physics that are involved when the droplet is more spread out versus when it's all balled up. Now, when it's spread out, so we have that thicker middle, the thinner perimeter, the perimeter evaporates faster because it's just thinner. There's a bigger surface area out at the perimeter than there is in the middle. So when that perimeter area starts to evaporate further, water wants to replace what just evaporated. So you can think of it as a circulation of fluid inside. So the droplet, the fluid within a droplet isn't stagnant by any means. It circulates around and circulates around and it circulates the water towards the perimeter where it evaporates more and then circulates back. And that's why getting back to the coffee ring, if you have your coffee granules, that's how the coffee gets out to the edges. And then as it's evaporating, it just gets pinned. It doesn't have anywhere to go. It gets squeezed out as the layer gets thinner and thinner and thinner during the evaporation. Now, let's add ethanol into here now. So now you have a water ethanol droplet. Ethanol likes to spread water out even more. And makes it even more thin. And, and the ethanol part is more volatile. So that part evaporates first. 
So you can actually, the, the, the circulation is more erratic, more um, violent, and actually that mixing, that circulation sort of helps, if there's any particles in there, it helps spreads them out much more efficiently and much more and much faster than what water would be by itself. So now, now that we sort of have our, that picture in our head of what water and ethanol does, now let's throw in our surfactants. Now let's throw in our polymers. Let's throw in our colloids. So what happens? Ethanol wants to escape first. It wants to evaporate towards the surface. It'll actually take some of those flavor compounds and surfactants with it because as it goes to the surface and as the ethanol evaporates, the surfactants are not liking their environment. With time, it becomes more and more water-like and less and less eth the ethanol starts to evaporate away. So what those surfactants do, now we're envision that ball and that tail that we talked about, it gets to the surface. It hates water so much that the tail will stick out and say, I'm, I'm going to be part of air. I'm not, I don't like this water environment. All the ethanol is gone. My ethanol buddies are gone, and now I want to stick the tail out. So now imagine all those surfactants and all those colloids are getting to the surface, and instead of forming a ball, they form a thin skin, a thin molecular skin. We use that a phrase, a monolayer, so a monolayer of chemicals. And we've actually uh, in visualized this with just a camera looking at how droplets evaporate. We notice that you typically should have a steady, a steady evaporation. But once that skin, that monolayer forms, the evaporation significantly decreases. So we noticed that the, the skin itself, even though you can't see the skin because it is like a, a few uh, molecules thick, that it starts to buckle and, form, and deform as that droplet evaporates more and more. So it's that polymer that we talked about earlier. It's that surfactants that are on the surface. And then as that droplet evaporates, that skin starts to collapse on itself. And that was the behavior that we noticed when we started to evaporate, uh, start to dilute whiskey and evaporate these droplets that we noticed the buckling of this monolayer. And then at the very end, we, it created these vibrant images that we termed whiskey webs. And then we sort of started going down that rabbit hole further as to why, uh, what, which whiskeys do it, which ones don't, why does it do it, what happens in between, can we actually apply this in some special way? And we should also make a mention here that if you want to get an idea about what this does look like, make sure you go to whiskeywebs.org and there's all kinds of good information and, and imagery and everything like that. I mean, the best way that I could possibly describe it is you are almost looking at some sort of makeup of a galaxy is what it looks like, the way that they have sort of like this black and white um, with, I mean, it, it's, it's like a galaxy mixed with a DNA uh, makeup is what it would look like. And it's it's a really cool looking piece of artwork almost at the end of the day, but there's a lot of a lot of cool science that, that goes into this too. A good question for you as well is you talk about the different proofings, like what were you testing at proof wise to be able to pull something that that looks as it does today, that it looks like this uh definitely like a spider web, if you will, spider web galaxy, like <laughs> it keeps going on. I can keep keep thinking of all kinds of uh analogies for it here. Yeah. So why? So getting back to that study that we talked about, trying to relate to the Howard Stone work, where if you took a a foolproof droplet and evaporated, it was a thin film. Okay, great. If you diluted it too much, like if you went down say to twenty proof or so, it then formed that coffee ring that we discussed earlier. It's sort of that in between. You take about a forty, yeah, about forty proof or so, forty fifty proof, and it depends on the brand. That's where we started noticing this magic to happen because it's a perfect balance of what conditions do you need for that monolayer to form, but then simultaneously, once that monolayer forms, because it only forms once a portion of the ethanol has evaporated and moved away because the ethanol was, was the solvent that helped disperse everything and keep everything homogeneous and uniform. Now that the ethanol goes away, as it, you're doing this evaporation process and forming that skin, we noticed that for a one microliter drop at about 40 to 50 proof, that's where that skin formed, but then it still evaporated, but there was enough reduction in surface area for it to fold over on itself. If you think of taking a sheet of paper and then sort of squeezing it in 
your piece of paper is going to fold over on itself. And what happens with those images that you were describing is we actually shine light on it. And what is the, those white, vibrant features, the ones that reflect light more heavily, those are where the folds are. And the, even though there's a layer everywhere, if it's, if it's uniform and it's not buckled, that area does not reflect light. I like to uh, create an, uh, state an analogy with respect to if, there's a, if you have a piece of glass and that glass is cracked, a lot of people, they try to glance light off of it. Like they don't look straight through it. They try to like move the pane of glass side to side, try to have light strike it at an angle, and then you see the crack, or at least you see it more apparent. And that's exactly what's happening here in that the crack in this monolayer, the fold in this monolayer, reflects light a lot more heavily, uh, he um, readily than the areas that aren't folded. And what we do and why the features, why, why, why the features are what they are is that we have a ring of LEDs and the ring of LEDs shine in from the side. And on, the only features that we see are reflected features. And that's exactly what, what their product is. So the, the background is all black. There's no light coming, hitting the lens directly. This is all indirect light from the light that is scattered and reflected off those folded features. It's really cool. And, and so I guess from a, a scientific point of view, I mean, I guess if you are science, you've got to prove that it's a, uh, it is consistent and that it's just not different every single time. So if I take uh, three different bottles of Elijah Craig and I proof them down, am I going to see a similar pattern formed? I mean, are they all going to kind of be a little snowflake-like, but they should be relatively similar compared to a completely different brand at three different bottles? So what we did is that we, because this was a great question and anyone who does experimental science needs to know that you have to repeat your results. You need to see, is it repeatable or is this just, is just a fluke? And then of course, explain the science behind it. So on the same day, if you take that sample, so let's say you take your Elijah Craig out, you dilute it down to that magic 40, 50 proof, and then we have slides and you just drop out like say 10 droplets, we'll say, just go down the line and then you look at those 10 droplets. Now they're not going to be identical, meaning that like no two snowflakes are identical, but they will have the same type of shape and the same type of pattern to the point where we have a rather crude algorithm. We believe we can improve upon it, but we have a rather crude algorithm. So we take a picture of this. It's a digital image. We throw it into a computer program that we sort of mapped out. So we said, oh, there's more folds here. There's less folds here. Is it more dense over here? So we sort of have a, a pattern recognition system, and then we build a library. So our Elijah Craig library is this image, whatever that image is. So we what we did is we tested three different whiskeys from the same distiller, but different types, not, diff not different bottles of the same, but like say different flavors or different, um, different types. And from that, we were able to, we create our library. We said, okay, bourbon A, bourbon B, bourbon C, here's the representative image. And then we threw a mystery image at it. It could be one of those three. We threw a mystery image at it and said, okay, based on this mystery image, pair it up, tell us which one it most resembles. And it was right over 90% of the time when we kept on throwing images at it. Now we need to expand our library. And I do have to say that it's, it's sensitive to a fault. What I mean by that is that if the humidity changes, if your water source changes, if like it is very, very sensitive to, ch to changes within your environment. So we're trying to think of ways of making this more robust in terms of the, um, in, in terms of the testing, but it is sensitive. We have tested over 80, yeah, 80 American whiskeys in our lab. Now I use the phrase American whiskey, which includes bourbon. But anything that touches a new barrel, so your Tennessee whiskeys and your, your rise, anything that touches a new char barrel, I put under the umbrella American whiskey. And of those, I think of the 80 or so, all of them except for one produced a web. And we tested five different moonshines and they, so, so, so unaged whiskey, I'll say, those do not form a web. And then we tested a variety of scotches and other 
other whiskeys that don't touch a new barrel that it just say aged in used barrels, so Canadian whiskey and others, and they did not form webs either. So the the missing or the common link between all of those is that the whiskey touched a new barrel. In other words, from my perspective or my hypothesis, is that there is more surfactants and more polymers and just more chemical constituents readily available from that new aged barrel compared to others that reuse it. I love it. I love the hypothesis at the at, here we get it. We're like, this is it. This is what it all came down to. But I mean, I, I guess another question for you, since it's cool that we see that it only works with bourbon and then that's because it's a, a, a new filled barrel. What was the other bourbon that you said that didn't actually show a, a web? It was, now we only had one sample of it because it's tough to get, final reserve. So it was the 42 year final reserve. And and the good thing about the, these studies is I don't have, so don't envision my laboratory as like a bar with like hundred bottles of whiskey r- across the, the top of the lab, no, no, which that would draw a lot of trouble from the university, I'm sure. But what, would, uh, what it actually is, I just have all of them in a test tube. Because all I need is a shot. And from a shot, as we said earlier, I can do 20,000, 50,000, whatever. So it's really easy to go to a friend, a neighbor, a tasting shop, whatever, and say, and come in with a test tube and say, okay, this is who I am. <laughs> Got a lot of weird looks. Like here, here I'll, I'll buy a shot or I'll get a shot and I'll pour in this test tube and wrap it up and say, thank you, I'm on my way. So so now, no, it, it, it was final reserve. Um, it was 42 years. And we only, so I want, if someone out there wants to give me another different shot of their final reserve, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, but what we noticed is that at the 42 years, um, it has a really oaky flavor to it, at least what I'm, what I'm told is that there's almost too much polymer or too much surfactant. Like you can have, we took the whiskey and we spiked it with a surfactant and with a surfactant similar to that detergent, uh, washing dishes analogy is that now that layer is too fluid. It's not rigid anymore, or at least it's not rigid enough to fold. It's now fluid enough to just swirl around. So it doesn't doesn't become rigid enough with too much surfactant. So we believe that the final reserve has too much surfactant or other properties, chemical properties that prevent it from buckling in. And and the reason why we like that hypothesis is that some of our images like the, um, I think it was, yeah, the Van Winkle, uh, anything that's say 20 years or 15 years or more, we noticed that the webs do not form around the perimeter, or at least they're not as heavily present around the perimeter. And they're more, and the, the webs and folds occur more readily in the middle. And why that is, going back to our droplet evaporation uh, description, where fluid circulates around, when it circulates around, more chemicals become, especially surfactants, become more heavily concentrated at the perimeter because that's where it's evaporating and that's where things get trapped more readily compared to the middle. So if there's more surfactants at the perimeter, there's less likely for webs to occur there, at least in our older samples. So that's why we're sort of going down that path. And one thing that we're interested in pursuing is that there's some industries out there who try to do, um, we'll say, accelerated aging through a variety of processes. Um, one, I think uh, it's Cleveland Whiskey, I believe, um, where they do a cavitation process where they, um, we'll say, collapse bubbles and use that as a way to accelerate the aging process. So we're actually interested to see, could we use this as a marker to at least those who practice accelerated aging? Is this a way where we can just do a quick check of, say, a laboratory aging process? Interesting. What are, What other kind of purposes do you do you find out of this research of what it could potentially lead to? So going beyond bourbon, um, we are trying to think, can we use it for other food products? So, so of course, whiskey and the spirits industry have a generally high proof associated with, with their products, but say wine. I had someone from the wine industry said, hey, can you do this for our wine? Because anywhere where there's counterfeit, especially where spirits are involved, could we use this? So one thing I am going to say is that this technique is never going to replace, in my opinion, the high sophisticated chemical like liquid chromatography that I think Tom Collins talked about in one of your previous podcasts, this is not going to replace that. But this is just a nice, crude, just extremely inexpensive way. Like you can take these images with your smartphone with like a $3 plastic lens. Like you can easily do this. So with respect to the wine industry, 
Who's not to say, now we haven't tried it yet, but who's not to say that we can't add ethanol to it as opposed to taking the whiskey and diluting it down? Who's not to say that we can't take a product that has lower ethanol or maybe no ethanol and start to spike it with ethanol and see if we can get the same um, result or even spike it with polymers or surfactants to start to trigger, uh, to give it the right recipe, we'll say. And one thing that, that I should mention earlier with respect to the counterfeit and the web formation is that we took a controlled bourbon and then we spiked it with polymers and surfactants. And we noticed a controlled, repeatable change in this web pattern. So there's definitely like how it folds depends on the chemical composition because the chemical composition of that skin li- gives it a specific rigidity that will fold a certain way as it evaporates. So we're thinking, can we use this pattern as a way of a chemical fingerprint, a crude f- chemical fingerprint to sort of do a, a, a fast quality control of a certain product? That's really cool. So then you don't need to bust out the whole chromatography equipment to actually figure it all out. And when you when you did say that you know you're spiking this with um, different pieces like ethanol or uh, you know vanillin or anything like that, I mean, does anything like this that you're doing like you could see a way the web is formed? You could be like, oh, like this probably has a different type of taste character because it has this type of web. I mean, do you think that you could correlate taste to some of this? So the 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 physicist in me says yes you could physically do this but then the realist in me is like that's going to take a ton of work like you've seen a, <laughs> you, you've seen you've seen a flavor wheel like you know exactly how complex that thing can get and then also you've you've been uh, with respect to your interactions with Tom Collins and others you're familiar that there are hundreds and thousands of chemicals within bourbon and it's going to be tough for us to just pinpoint and say Oh look, there's a fold. That means there's more lignin, right? It's it's going to be really tough for us to do that. However, we 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 started going down this rabbit hole. I had a student um, actually uh, reach out to Funai, and Funai is one who who say uh, they joined up with Lexmark years ago, and we actually have a bourbon printer in our lab where you can actually you f- we fill these cartridges up with diluted bourbon, and then we can print out droplet by droplet. And why we do that is there's a hot topic in the past few years with respect to artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if we actually wanted to improve our algorithms and actually go down the the path that you recommended, we need to collect a lot of data. We need to collect like, oh, here's the flavor wheel. Here's the chromatography profile of this bourbon. Okay, let's dilute it, print off a thousand droplets, take images, and let the artificial intelligence and let the machine learning take over. So is it possible to do it? Yes. There's going to be a lot of effort there and we'll, we'll see if, if that's a, if that's a fruitful route down the road. Well, I learned a whole lot of new things today. I learned that there's such a thing as a bourbon printer. Uh, so I'm <laughs> is it, count me in for two of those. Well, yeah, but every, everything means so tiny, right? So it, it's it, that, that's in my realm, there, there's, a, there's, not a lot of waste, but also there's not a lot of usage. It's just small, small, small droplets. So it's more analytical than say, say, get something out of it. Absolutely. Well, I do want to say thank you so much for sharing your research and, and sharing more about, you know, really the evaporation and really what happens because it's a really cool thing. And I encourage everybody to make sure you go to that website at whiskeywebs.org and you can really see what these look like. I know Stuart held one up here on the, on the video a little bit earlier ago, but it it really is, it's, it is a cool piece of science that you really get to see what's happening to, to more aspects of whiskey. Even, granted, you're never going to be able to consume it, but you get to see it once it's dried about really what it does look like. It's, it's pretty neat. And, and that's, and you're absolutely right. Like, I think be, of, of all the things, like, is there fundamental science behind it? Sure. That's great. But it helps us communicate and connect the dots between bourbon and art and science. Because if you hold up that picture to someone, they're like, what is that? And when you say, oh, this is just bourbon, they're like, okay, hold on. Wait a minute. You have to tell me more here. Like this, you can't just say, "Oh, look at this pretty picture," and it's just bourbon. So it helped us. Like we were able to go to the Smithsonian. We were able to talk with like thousands of people to come up and say, "Hey, this is what bourbon is." And by the way, look at these pictures. Isn't they neat? Oh yeah, and let's talk about science. So I'm. We we have students. Like I've had. I have a traveling display 
where we go to different events, whether it be a charity event or some others. And, and if there's anybody out there that has these types of events, as things start to open up with respect to going to distilleries and just, we, we want to be able to uh, communicate science and communicate the science of bourbon to a broader audience. And this is just a, a nice vehicle and a nice method for us to do so. And it's very, very cool. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. So if people want to learn more about you, more about Whiskey Webs, how, how do they do it? So as you said, Whiskey Webs with an EY, the proper way of doing it. So the whiskeywebs.org, uh, uh, we have uh, just all the science articles, anything that's associated with it. If there's any upcoming events or charitable events or w- everything that we've done is on there. Any recordings will be on there. We also um, sell aluminum prints and coasters. We use a local printer to do that. I don't pocket any of this money. It's just all going towards getting students and getting materials and just keeping that bourbon science momentum going. Well, fantastic. So now you know you put a donation it actually goes to a good cause. Here. It's not just <laughs> going, it's not lying in Stewart's pocket yeah. so he can get more more whiskey so he can do more samples. But I tell you what, if you do need something that you want to try out, I've got a whole bar behind me. We can we can talk afterwards. Absolutely. I can get you a sample or two. So so, Sue, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure to learn more about what you're doing and, and really the science behind it, because these are the episodes that they really hook people in. They really want to know more about it because there's a whole other world that's just more than just drinking out of the glass. So it was a pleasure to, to learn more about your research. So thank you for doing that. So make sure you check out Stuart on whiskeywebs.org. Make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play. I mean, it's we're everywhere, and even on YouTube. Make sure you also follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. And if you want to help support us, make sure you support us at patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. Cheers, everybody. With that, we'll see you all next week. Mm